I've listened to a couple of your interviews and you talk a lot about building a high performing team culture. What, what does that look like for you and how do you encourage uh, a healthy culture amongst your team? So you might well have, have you know, heard of the author Pat, Patrick Lencioni and his books, you know, Five Dysfunctions of the Team and Death by Meetings. And uh, he's got a whole series of fables that he tells through his books and his, uh, his consulting organization, The Table Group, does some great work with lots of, lots of growth stage companies as well. Um, he talks about how the foundations of any high performance team is trust. Um, and you know you, you work your way up from trust, um, and he's got that pyramid that we can we can link off to um, from this. Um, but you know for people to kind of dig into in in, in more depth. Um, but you know trust then enables you to have kind of conflict because um, when you've got no trust, you can't really have good conflict. Um, and when you've got good trust, that then enables you to have good kind of conflict, enables you to come to real commitment, uh, and that enables you to have real accountability, which allows you to have real results. Um, but no trust trust means you can't really you know have good conflict you can't commit to anything you avoid accountability and then you're inattentive to results and so i think that's a really useful framework um but the bedrock of all of that is trust and it's a question i ask myself regularly you know you, do i trust those around me do they trust me and how can we both mutually build those you know, build that trust um and then the second thing is to layer on top of that is much more kind of a bit more esoteric which is are we genuinely proud of the work we're doing I think being proud of the work you're doing is a leading indicator of you know the results going in the right way. Um, and I think it's important you know to, to to measure the inputs, not just measure the outputs, not just to see did we create enough demand, did we close enough deals, but you know the preceding indicators of that, the leading indicators of that are you know knowing all that we know, are we confident, are we proud in what we're doing? Um, and so that's another piece that is you know perhaps not so easily measurable, but something I look for. Yeah, I love that. How do you get a temperature check of that? Is it a, like a monthly survey with employees or how do you stay on top of the sentiment? So I, th I think the first thing I do is we ask each other it. You know, when someone's ask. producing a new bit of content, a new ebook, a new bit of research, like, are we proud of this? But also, like, do we need to be proud of this? There's some pieces of what you do that perhaps are more fundamental or infrastructural or, or perhaps they're just, you know, something you've got to do to fill a gap in between two things you're doing um, where maybe, you know, you have to be only five out of 10 proud of it because it's just filling a gap that you know is necessary for somebody. Um, yeah. But then it's making sure that, you know, the things that you really care about that you're asking that question, you know, are we genuinely proud of it? And are, are we going to press publish before we're really proud? Um, and, you know, I think a paddle, you know, my personal challenge here is to do you know the best the best work of my career here, and it's a challenge I have for my team here that we're going to do the best work of our careers at this business. Um, and part of that is us being genuinely proud about what we're delivering. Mm, I love that. That I'm getting some ideas of how we might start doing that in our business now. Um, so we we've spoken about the team. Let's talk about the the leader, the marketing leader. How does this person? need to evolve and grow as their team grows. Um, and maybe you can relate that to your personal experience going from your startup to, to a large organization. Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked a little bit already about you know the need to you know be involved in alignment and a lot involved in marketing of the marketing. Um, I think that's one thing that's really important, um, and being aware and being open and embracing of the fact that that's actually often where your leverage comes from. If there's if there's a great idea but you've not got that alignment with other teams and there's not the simplicity of its explanation that can carry across other teams, um, then it's just it's not going to get out the door. Mm. Um, and so I think that that's that's one piece of it. You know, we used that phrase to, uh, just just earlier that it's important to work on the business, not in the business. And it's something you know I'm constantly asking myself and trying to up level on. And you know, it was my commitment to to Jimmy, my my boss, the COO and president of Paddle, and, and Christian, our COO, a CEO and founder, um, as we did, did my mid mid year review, that I was going to walk out and have my first proper holiday since I joined Paddle. Um, you know, and then come back in in the room. And clear my diary. And I told my team that as well. There's going to be some one-to-ones and stuff that I make more, more infrequent um, because I need to clear more space in my diary to actually spend some time working on the business and working on the team and on the strategy that will help everybody run faster rather than be working in, in the business. And I'm... You know, I love being proximate to my team. I, I'm, I'm very able to cope with many, many meetings a day and go for back-to-back -back Zooms all day long. Um, and that can be a real problem 
it can be a real crutch that I like being with mm-hmm. people busy. And then I find I'm not getting any of the time I need to go deeper on things. And so protecting that space um, to work on the business is, is a real critical piece of it too. Yeah. Do you have a, a regular cadence where you, you audit your calendar and like just keep yourself accountable to, to actually doing that? Or is it when, you know, someone tell your, your boss tells you, Hey, are you working on a business or in a business? So I do think that kind of that informal social accountability really helps. So by telling people that's what I want to do, then I find they check up on me or they say, Andrew, your days look pretty crazy at the moment. Have you, have you, you know, taken a look? Um, you know, it's certainly something I keep a conversation with my wife on, you know, is this, is this you know, giving me enough space for my family? Um, and so, yeah, there is that element of checking it myself. I'm not particularly rigorous about kind of every Friday analyzing my diary and splitting it out. Um, but I find, you know, by, by having it as one of the points of things I want to improve um, and having told multiple other people about it is something that I'm constantly mm-hmm. referring back to. It's not something I'm good at. Like I would yeah. you know, spend 10 hours a day different elements of what we're doing and feel completely happy. I just know it's something that I've got to get better at for the for the good of the team. That that's an amazing tactic, just engineering that social pressure upon yourself to to do the things you say you'll do. Um, I love that. Yeah. And I, I also, you know, a, like a personal productivity hack in the these kind of busy um Zoom crazy days is I like to I like to move locations. I love I love variety. And so I've got my home office but I've also got several places around our house and property that I can work from. <laughs> um, there's also some cafes nearby. Um, some of those cafes are rubbish to kind of take calls from. And so I know that if I'm there, I can't just jump on a Zoom call. I'll mm. have to be doing something else. Um, there's areas around our house that have got no Wi-Fi. Um, and so, you know, using that as well as a bit of a hack um, that I know that while I'm driving to this cafe and while I'm there, I won't be on Slack, I won't be on Zoom, and I won't be checking stuff. Or I know that if I go to our garden room, I won't be on Wi-Fi. And so those yeah. can be really helpful as well as a physical barrier. Ah, that's great. So you mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago that it's as important to look at the inputs um, as you do the outputs on some of the things that you're working on. Just make sure you're proud of what you're putting out there. And I, I heard in one of your interviews that you believe in investing in initiatives that may not have an immediate payoff and pipeline in the next quarter or two, but still very important to the business. What are some examples of those sort of things that that you've worked on that you're proud about that, you know, you have to get buy in on that? Hey, it's not going to generate pipeline immediately, but it's very important to the business still. So in any growth stage startup. It fundamentally does come down to revenue, right? You're trying to grow revenue. Um, if you're in a for-profit business, that's the fundamental measure that your shareholders are going to be looking at. There's lots of other measures around it, and we want to be good citizens, and we want it to be sustainable, and we want it to be able to continue for multiple years. Um, but the way I think about this is I look at it as, as the two timeframes of marketing. You've got the stuff that you've got to do in order to hit this quarter's demand gen and next quarter's demand gen to make sure your salespeople can grow revenue. And then you've got to do all the things that have very little impact over the course of the next couple of quarters. But if you don't do them, the the, the pool you are fishing out of in a year or two's time will be too small or will be obsolete. And so then that comes down to what is our company message and story? How are we positioned and how are we trying to work on that positioning? You know, what is our what is our strategy around branding and community building and media and building kind of the the, the pool we want to fish out of? in the future helpful to our target market so that there's some reciprocity and affinity that's being stored up for the future. Um, and so for me, you know, it's less about trying to have the argument that there's lots of things we need to do and spend money on that are non-revenue related. It's really just about timeframes and just making sure people know that it's not just about investing in today, it's about investing in tomorrow as well. Yeah, it's fascinating to hear that. And, and a lot of conversations uh, I've had when folks are in a, like, if it's a VP of demand gen, they're feeling that pressure to, to build that pipeline and coverage for the sales team immediately in the next one or two quarters. And it's tough to get out of that, that hamster wheel, I suppose. Yeah. So it yeah. seems like a muscle you had to build. How do you typically advise maybe other marketing leaders to, to build that muscle and get buy-in on those longer term initiatives when CEO and sales are pounding the table about pipeline? So firstly, I think, especially early stage, you don't have the 
you, the right or the luxury of thinking about two or three years out if you're not doing this quarter, next quarter. Um, and so I think, you know, firstly, it's probably about doing those shorter term things first to, to win the right to think about those longer term things. Um, I do think that it comes from the top. If you've got a CEO who just doesn't see that at all um, and a head of sales that doesn't see that at all, then you're going to really struggle. And bringing them on that journey is utterly critical. Um, so if you think about you know, analyst relations as an example tactic within marketing, every salesperson would love to open up every conversation with the with the prospect knowing about us because we were in the top right of the last Gartner quadrant or the last forest away. But very few salespeople would like you, sales leaders would like you to take, you know, two days a week for the next six months to build the relationship, spend the money um, and generate um, you know, <laughs> all the work that needs to be done in order for you to get there. And so, you know, part of that is making sure you're delivering what is needed now and then actually not being not being too public or showy or constantly updating everyone about all the things you're doing that are se- mm. seeding the future. Um, and then that comes down to your sense of trust. We talked about trust earlier in your team. That is about the trust yeah. you have with you yourself and your head of sales, with, with yourself and your founder. Um, and, you know, letting them know that this is what you're doing, but it's something that actually they're going to have to trust you on and that you're going to keep them updated on to the point where it's relevant. And I think that's a, that's a really key element of this because some people get very... Um, passionate about talking about the constant updates of what they're doing and the activity yeah. they're doing won't bear fruit. And I think often that's that's going to be a waste of time and erodes trust rather than builds it. Yeah. Oh, that is fascinating. It all comes back down to trust. I I appreciate that. Yeah. And and you know, I was just thinking because you asked the question, you know, what are the ways of actually doing this? What are some examples? And I kind of answered with a a, a, a frame of reference rather than examples. And I don't want to don't want to leave it there because um that, that makes it too easy for me. You know, I, I think <laughs> you know there's there are a few things we've done recently. A paddle, I can talk to you know some examples from, from prior companies too. Um, but you know, let's take the the this we were just chatting before before this this acquisition documentary um, we did. So we did this acquisition of Profitwell, a couple hundred million dollars, big for us, massive kind of transformational moment moment in the uh, in the life of our, of our business. Um, I'm, I'm wearing wearing the shirt right now. You can see you can see the yeah, two logos on the back. Um, and having been through a few acquisitions recently. Um, I asked both founders whether they would be up for us putting cameras into lots of the Zoom rooms and lots of the physical rooms we were having conversations in and recording everything. Now, there were lots of reasons why that was a stupid idea. Um, Firstly, you know, were we actually going to be able to buy this business? Would having cameras in the room make people act differently? Would us want? Would we want to play up to the camera and try and do things better or differently? Would we be less kind of concerned in the DD if we were concerned about what film we were going to make? There's all those kind of things, and then there's the like the time it takes and the money it takes, the focus it takes, um, and then there's like, is it is it a good story? You know, are we ever going to do anything with this? There's the risk of it just being left on the cutting room floor. Um, but we did all of that, and I think we produced something really compelling. It's a, a contact of mine, a guy called Pitt Piper, who's an award-winning documentary filmmaker who who um, pulled the storyline together. It's a simple 18-minute documentary called We Sign Tomorrow. You can get it on YouTube and, uh, and on our website. And you know, that's an example of something that does nothing for our immediate demand gen. Mm-hmm. But we serve software founders who are trying to scale their business. And many of them will have an aspiration of going through an acquisition or making acquisitions. And there's no content that's really detailed, high dev content no. around the journey and the story and the personal angst and the emotions of what goes on. And so we look to make that. Um, and I, you know, I believe, you know, certainly from people I've spoken to who we've, we've showed it to when I've been in the room, there is that sense of, you know, why and how <laughs> have the capacity in the midst of one of the most kind of chaotic times in any company's history to also do this at the same time. Um, and I love that kind of WTF response from the market. And there's a few others of those we've got planned coming up over the next uh, over the next few months where I think it'll have that same response. 